Okay, well, thanks very much indeed, uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this uh, interesting uh, period, uh, which is, I should say, a work in progress. So a lot of the work is still ongoing, um, uh, in the sense that I have to finish half work that Heike has already uh, begun, using materials um, from the National Archives in London about this particular episode. Um, but I think it might be worth just trying, uh, without too much of a stretch, to draw a connection between what I'll be trying to deal with in this paper on the 1960s, in the middle of the 20th century, with those wonderful papers that we ex had yesterday, and indeed this morning, I think, but uh, particularly, I suppose, the historical papers uh, yesterday, uh, thinking about you know, the mechanisms and circumstances that uh, led to the establishment of a network of European universities in the medieval and early modern period. And in a curious way, there are, despite the huge differences in time, uh, in some senses, what I'll be talking about clearly is shaped by those earlier moments. And what came out very strongly, I think, from yesterday is the sense that um, universities were established in particular places, often for quite local, kind of princely initiatives associated with particular issues of local power. But, uh, particularly uh, in the paper by Howard, the um, sense that that was a European network um, pretty much from you know, 1500 onwards at least, in the sense that when one area of that network collapses for whatever reason, another area, as it were, develops directly as a consequence, so that it's a network as well as being driven by local conditions. But, uh, as we perhaps didn't have enough time to talk about that, there were these intriguing blank spots on that European map where remarkably little happens. And it went where the allure of the university was stubbornly resisted. And one of them, of course, was England uh, in the early modern period, um, which we did remark about, where there were only these two somnolent medieval institutions of Oxford and Cambridge sitting there some distance from London, um, representing, as it were, on the English case, and in the entire network. What's so fascinating and remarkable about that blank space is that it is precisely in that period, the 17th and into the 18th century especially, when that area of Europe, more than anywhere else in Europe, becomes the workshop of the world, becomes the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, home to the largest city in Europe, Paris, London overtaking Paris in about 1700. So there's some rather remarkable issues to be addressed there. And putting it bluntly, do you really need universities if that's our social, economic and in intellectual history of Europe? Precisely the area which generates an entrepreneurial culture like no other does so without modern universities of any kind, only with two medieval institutions of that kind. So um, it's a re remarkable thing to ponder that big question about the role that universities may or may not play, particularly in terms of economic uh, and social developments. But you then have to also immediately think of the other sorts of institutions which are existing in uh, England at that period, and as it were, filling the void that is left perhaps by universities. And they are those that remarkable other network of academies, learned associations, learned and literary and philosophical societies, which develop not just in the, the big cities, the royal societies of this world, but it's right down the urban hierarchy. It's places like Spalding in Lincolnshire, which has its literary and philosophical society from the 1760s. The famous case of Litchfield. Not so much Birmingham as people tend to assume in terms of the Lunar Society, where Erasmus Darwin and Joseph Priestley and Sire Wedgwood and all those others form a free-thinking institutional spaces of sociability and science and experimentation out with and in quite often, I love this notion of a defiant, uh, uh, um, uh, agenda that was uh, implicit in uh, uh, going to be the title of Jane's uh, presentation. This is a defiant act of, of, of sociability and science which is taking place outside of those formal institutions and arguably all the more effective for it. All those historians of science that write about this, Stephen Shapin, uh, Simon Schaffer and David Lux and all the rest of it, are, are intrigued by that process. 
Um, and in an English context, that's the process, untrammeled, unconstrained by medieval scholasticism, an experimental life. And it's that wonderful phrase, because it's about, it's about, uh, it's about um, an intellectual pursuit, a scientific pursuit, but it's also about sociability. And that phrase that Erasmus Darmus famously come, talk, talked about when he described those meetings on the nights, on Monday evenings of the full moon in Litchfield, a little philosophical laughing, which is what it was all about, coming together and enjoying the experience of experimentation. And yet, of course, in the English context, uh, it is ultimately uh, a matter that by the 19th century, uh, a new forms of civic governance, new forms of, of cities had developed, of course, these large industrial centers that felt inevitably that if they were to have the status of a city, not only would they need a cathedral, not only would they need all the trappings of some kind of medieval uh, uh, invented tradition, but that involved the creation of new universities. But it's a 19th century phenomenon, very largely uh, in uh, British, and indeed 20th century, as we'll see. And this is the map, I suppose, of the British universities that were founded uh, before 1960s. And you can see, I hope, just about from it, You've got a couple of ancient establishments, uh, and then you've got a, a small number of pre-1850 universities, which are essentially in London uh, um, and in Durham. And then you have um, this large, uh, larger number of red brick universities, as they were called, established in the later part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century in the great industrial cities of the North and Midlands. Um, and then there is a, a kind of fourth phase, perhaps often ignored in the history of British universities, which are the establishment of a series of universities in the interwar periods and indeed just after the Second World War in smaller cities, for the most part, that had not been in the vanguard of, of the greater industrial cities, the Liverpools, the Manchesters, the Sheffields, and Leeds, and so on. And they include my own University of Nottingham, but also Reading and Southampton and other places. Now, that's where England was, and it's a very unusual story. And I think it's unusual in really interesting ways that we shouldn't forget about if we do think about it. It's a European story, like every other story we're talking about, but it tells us something fundamental, I think, about the relationship between the city, uh, the, between the university and the city and the wider social uh, economic uh, realities. But what I'm going to be dealing with here is this addition to the network during the 1960s when um, it's popularly understood, I think, um, that the university network in Britain was um, rather substantially transformed. And what I'm look, going, we're going to be looking at in this paper is using I mean, the, the archival material re was released only about 15 to 20 years ago, so, but as laid un untouched in the National Archives about this process of major transformation in the uh, a network of uni British universities, or English universities, British, I should say, in the 1960s. We want first to examine the government's rationales for this expansion. And one of the really interesting questions I have at the base of all this is the way in that earlier process is ha essentially happening with minimum government coordination. It's entirely local, of course, to a situation in the 20th century where government, governance, government, central government, uh, assumes that it will have some role. But my, my theme will be that was a highly problematic engagement. So it's about the, the, the political rationale behind it, but also the extent to which geographical knowledge and issues of planning and sort of the understanding of the social and economic geography of the country shaped this process. So that's what we're, we're looking at. And during the 1960s, um, these existing universities that I showed a moment ago were, were an, an additional 24 new universities were established to, to the system, which you can see in that final sort of bluey green shade, um, effectively doubling the university si uh, size. This leading, of course, to an unprecedented increase in the percentage of 19 and 20 year olds attending university, which leapt from about 5% in 1960 to 14%, uh, going on 15% uh, just over a decade later in 1972. Now, it should be emphasized right at the outset that these figures are um, lamentably low by European compa uh, comparisons in 1960s and still remain very, very low by 1970s. So it's moving from a very limited access to higher education to a still limited one, but significantly greater. Now, conventionally, this expansion of the 1960s is linked to um, a single report. 
which if you're English, British is often invoked, and particularly last year, because it was um, the 50th anniversary of it, um, in 1963 by a guy called uh, Lionel Robbins, who I think is there, and there you can see him in all this, his grandeur. Um, and in this report that he produced in... Um, uh, 1963 is widely regarded as a kind of case study of academically informed post-war planning, particularly in which statistical analysis and economic theory were at the core, it was claimed, of a more rational decision-making process. In other words, universities were being coordinated as part of a national planning process. That, at least, is part of the rhetoric. Now, Robbins is a very interesting guy. I have not much time to talk about him, but he was a prominent economist at the London School of Economics, uh, well known for, as it were, reducing, reintroducing into that institution in the decades before he was involved in this report, continental uh, economic theory, particularly for the Austrian school. His relationship uh, with monetarism was rather difficult. He was certainly no Keynesian, but he was definitely not straightforwardly a monetarist either. So his, uh, his position in the history of 20th century economics is a rather ambiguous and interesting one, but he was a classic government sort of you know, academic fixer, a person that always interests me, these people that move effortlessly from the corridors of power in Westminster to um, the, the common rooms of leading universities. Now, our archive institutions, to cut to the chase to some extent, reveal that this widespread belief, as it were, um, in the Robbins report, as somehow or other the key turning point here, is extremely misleading, to put it mildly, because in fact, and um, there's a copy of the front cover of the report, it was actually part of a much larger process, um, which goes back into the 1950s and well into the post-Robbins period. And far from actually um, creating the institutions which we popularly associate with the Robbins report, those great so-called plate glass universities, that term being famously coined by Max Beloff in 1969 to describe the handful of new universities that were classically associated with the period of expansion in uh, higher uh, education in Britain, universities like Sussex and Warwick and Kent and York and Lancaster. These, for the most part, were actually already in the system, had already been agreed way before Robbins. And the point we will try and emphasise is that the Robbins report, that period of 1961 to 63, was to a certain extent a kind of post hoc justification for processes of decision making which were highly conventional in that earlier sense. They were local initiatives rather than anything to do with national coordination. But the three phases, just to uh, talk to you, talk them through, is a pre-Robbins phase, 1958 to 1961, associated with um, a guy called Sir Keith Murray rather than Robbins. And Sir Keith Murray was a, a similar sort of figure, um, uh, a prominent academic in his own right, uh, uh, master of uh, Lincoln College, Oxford, um, and he had been appointed to, to a chair an organisation called the University Grants Committee, which some of us of a certain age will remember uh, as a kind of earlier incarnation of a current institution. And it was essentially there to dispense government money across universities in a wise and equitable way, but for the most part achieved largely by lobbying from within governance rather than any rational kind of planning approach of the kind we claim that we have at the moment. Um, and he was in charge of this earlier, and indeed really rather all important period. The Robbins Report then comes in 19, early 1960s, a two year period when that work went on in that. And then finally, there's a period after the Robbins Report was published, um, and uh, the, uh, again, the, the, the UGC taking the key role here uh, under a guy called Carswell, who chaired a intergovernmental working party. So the first and simple point is uh, a, a one of kind of a uh, uh, historical issue about kind of destabilizing this sense that the Robbins report was a fundamental transformation. One of the other great kind of mis mis mysteries of this is how that expansion of university uh, in the 1960s tends to get associated misleadingly with the Labour government of 1964 to 70. 1970, the government of Harold Wilson, which of course used all the rhetoric of the white heat of technology and that we would transform Britain and all the rest of it, all of the decisions had actually been taken way before that government came uh, into power. 
So it's a complicated, more complicated story than is often <coughs> suggested. And this um, it, slide kind of shows this. In the remainder of the paper, we want to outline how the geographies of the British university expansion varied across these three periods and develop an argument that the university expansion in the 1960s was altogether messier and more arbitrary process that is, con is conventionally thought. And that in itself tells us a great deal, it seems to me, about the mechanisms by which universities can move through these radical changes of, of expansion as well as contraction. Um, at a specific time when the British University Centre system at the moment is at a critical juncture where we're wondering about issues of contraction and expansion, it seems very important not only to look back into the distant past to understand the inspirations that might come to us from reconsidering the medieval university, but also just back into living memory also, and at least to get it right in terms of what were the factors and processes that shaped the expansion of university uh, uh, in the British context in this period of the 1960s. So let us very quickly go through these different phases. Um, the first phase that I want to look about is the, the pre-Robbins period, 1950 to 1961. This process was triggered by an increasing number of essentially local and regional councils, bottom-up stuff, approaching national government with the aim of uh, achieving some sort of national backing for their aspirations to establish a new university within their territories, as it were. The initiatives were encouraged by post general post-war debates about the future demand for university graduates in the expanding professions, particularly in science and technology, and the need to enhance the participation of geographically and economically disadvantaged strata within the population. And the first successful approach, which is indicated on this graph, I think, um, was uh, submitted in March 1956 to this UGC committee um, by W.G. Stone, who was Director of Education for the County Borough of Brighton. And this led, ultimately, fairly quickly, to an agreement in principle by the UGC and with the backing then of government that a new university, which became the University of Sussex, should be established two years later on a completely new site, brand new, the kind of universities that has been talked about in the Middle East a moment ago. And this success story was um, then uh, widely covered in the press and pro prom prompted a, you know, a flurry of activity Activity, um, to the same UGC subcommittee which was then established to look into the wider question of university colleges in April 1959 and a variety of new uh, proposals are put forward. So the, the simple point is it's a kind of bottom-up initiative, it's local initiatives influencing the UGC initially and through that influencing, uh, pushing at an open door of government. Now the subcommittee chaired by Murray that I've mentioned, and Murray by the way was an agricultural economist that, who steered the UGC through the decades of, the, of 1953 to 68, uh, 63. And there were essentially a series of about a dozen meetings that took place, and that's all that, that was uh, involved with this whole process. And it recommended the establishment of six further new universities remarkably quick, just done overnight almost, um, to establish the ones that we popularly associated with Robbins. This is way before Robbins had been involved. And they involved not only uh, um, Sussex, um, but all the, also the ones that I've mentioned. What is intriguing about that, as Max Beloff uh, in his book of 1969 on the Plate Gas University put it, yeah, without a single debate in Parliament, not considered national level at all, entirely driven by local initiatives. What was intriguing, as uh, I think people have talked about this, is the nature of these universities. Not only were they you know, pl classic plate glass, modernist, greenfield sites being produced from nowhere, but they were in particular types of locations. And they were also given particular names, which is interesting, because they were so uncomfortable with the idea of them being associated with traditional cities that they assumed names that denied their involvement with a city. And they started to talk about themselves as being essentially based upon counties or indeed a rather rural, bucolic idea. So you, what have you got? You've got Sussex, you've got Kent, you've got Essex, you've got East Anglia. Intriguingly, most intriguingly of all, you've got Warwick, which is just a lie. It's not in Warwick at all, it's in Coventry. It's like one of those Ryanair airports that <laughs> pretend to be in Heart of Frankfurt, but are actually miles away. So don't say that to Nigel Thrift, by the way, who is the vice -chan geographer, vice chancellor of the university. And it was only in the robust country of the north, where you have very large counties like Yorkshire and Warwick, uh, Lancashire, 
that they finally came clean and those two new universities said, yeah, we're in York and we're in, of all places, Lancaster. So there's a sort of really interesting weird thing about this. This is white heat of technology, new type of universities, thrusting, modern, and we put them in lovely Sussex and we pretend that we're surrounded by green fields and cows. We are surrounded by green fields and cows and all the rest of it. Greenfield sites outside of small and uh, medium sized county towns away from um, uh, centres of um, major population. Now, what's this slide here? This is still the pre Robbins decision. That's the, 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 the issue that, that takes place. There's a series of converted university college in these new plate glass universities. And indeed, there was a good deal of debate about this, and much of it celebratory, recognising, of course, that Britain did need these universities, that we were lagging behind everybody else. And here's this rather famous little, um, one of many, many editorials in The Times uh, and other newspapers after Red Brick Mushroom, that these universities will be mushrooming up in, in various places. Now, there were uh, these seven, and there were also uh, 21 unsuccessful proposals put forward in this first expansion say, say, phase by similarly sized university towns wanting to have universities. And this is, I think, I suppose the key thing about this present, this, this paper is we're interested in those other places that didn't get accepted, didn't work their way through this process. And then ultimately, a kind of counterfactual geography that might emerge what might the university system have looked like had uh, other places been uh, uh, given uh, n a national support for this. But anyway, it supports the, the general impression we're trying to in indicate here is of a, a, a relatively upward uh, process, a from bottom-up process with relatively little coordinated national planning. Now, um, as these large, the new universities of the 19th century lo located in these large industrial cities, where they had served a predominantly local clientele, these new foundations uh, uh, of uh, the 20th century, both the earlier phase and this one, were in smaller locations uh, and, and these greenfield sites. Now, um, oh, that's indicated by that slide here, which we don't need to worry about. It's just making this simple point about the, the nature of the urban hierarchy, which suddenly became the dynamic sector of the urban hierarchy in terms of population growth and pre-Robbins uh, universities I'm talking about are indicated there by that slide. Now, what happens uh, also at this point, uh, in order to provide a kind of post hoc justification for what was essentially a kind of really random process of quick decision making to do this fairly quickly, driven from the bottom rather than the top, was um, the uh, UGC subcommittee responsible for this um, decided it really needed to produce some kind of consultation exercise in which it would invite uh, people and institutions, uh, Federation of British industries, a variety of different uh, 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 agencies, National Union of Students in Scotland rather than England, interestingly, to submit reports. And it was a completely random selection of people. So some of the names might be familiar there as individuals. One of them was a rather interesting character called Billy Bolchin, WGV Bolchin. He was professor of geography at Swansea University who submitted a lengthy report um, lamenting, effectively, the lack of any systematic engagement with the fundamental economic and social and uh, economic and social geographies of the country in terms of making any of these decisions. The same argument was made by a demographic uh, historian and sociologist DEC Ever Eversley and there's a picture of good old Billy Bolchin and there's this wonderful map that he produced. Uh, he produced this somewhat earlier in 1958 but it was uh, based upon a longer tradition of kind of uh, regional and urban and regional planning in uh, the early decades of the 20th century. It goes back to people like uh, C.B. Fawcett, the provinces of England, in which he thought about regional devolution within England based upon newly constructed regional uh, centres that would be focused primarily on newly constructed universities. So that long tradition was exemplified by Bolchin, whose report was uh, treated with a certain amount of contempt by the good figures uh, in the uh, UGC at the time. And moving on quickly then um, to the Robbins period itself um, to uh, reinforce the sort of general argument that we're making here. Um, 
uh, it's recently been argued that you know that, that, that um, the the main driver of trying to establish the uh, Robbins report would effectively to provide this post hoc justification for decisions already made was a recognition in government that they needed to as it were take control of a process that they felt otherwise might um, um, go in all sorts of uh, unintended directions. So in other words, reflecting to some extent the kind of arguments that people like Bolchin were making. And it was an, a recognition that you needed to have about 270 to perhaps 200,000 students should be the target for the 1970s. That's 10% of the student numbers that we have today. So it shows what we're talking about at this point. So a royal commission was to be established to oversee a process that was already underway in ways that appeared to be somewhat um, beyond the control of central government. And Robbins was uh, appointed in 1961 to carry this forward. So it was an attempt, effectively, to take control of a process that was already well underway. And arguably, what well, all it did was actually stop that process rather than encourage it, because all it did was have 100 and 111 meetings, have consider 400 written uh, submissions, 120 interviews, and several site visits to different places to give, I wouldn't say the illusion of planning, but to give the sense that the government was taking some sort of key control over this. This is at the latter phase of the Conservative regime before the Labour Party came to power in 1964. So the task then was to effectively advise governments on what should happen in the future. And over the next 12, 12, uh, two years, that was the sort of activity that was going on. The Robbins conclusion was essentially to increase the target number for students in the university system significantly to about 220,000 by the early 19th. 70s, and to recommend an institute further institutional expansion around the creation of a further new six new universities. But the majority of these were to be upgraded existing institutions. Colleges of advanced technology, in particular, were to be converted into universities, including, of course, Loughborough. Rather well, interestingly, this was based upon um, the fact that these, this, this particular co and royal commission had more money at its disposal, so they could go abroad and start looking at places abroad, and they did. They went to um, MIT, of course, and technical universities in Zurich and Delft, and suggested that the next phase should be these kind of technological colleges of advanced technology being converted into new universities but with a rather, as we can see, in a rather different geography to it. So we move into the post-Robbins uh, period quite quickly. The response to Robbins' recommendations was to be carried forward by the very same institution, the University Grants Commission, which had been essentially overseeing the process before. By now, the University Grants Commission had a new chair, the rather wonderfully uh, interesting character of Sir John Wolfenden. And those of you uh, who know anything about 20th century British uh, social and cultural life will recognise his name not because of his involvement in this uh, institution, the University Grants Committee, but as the person that chaired and produced the report on the decriminalisa decriminalisation of homosexuality in Britain in 1957. So a rather interesting and important character in his own right. But he was by then, you know, a leading academic in his own right, but an educationalist primarily, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Reading. And he um, put forward a whole series of further proposals that went on in, in, in this in this way. Um, uh, rather amusingly, to give again this kind of notion that it was a, a, an inv uh, people could, uh, institu uh, go, um, local authorities could apply and still be considered for processes that were largely decided already by then, um, an open invitation for bids was launched for new universities. And, and this was published in the Times Educational Supplement on the 27th of September, the 27th of December, uh, 1960, uh, was that what year was that? 1963, that's right, after the publication of the Robbins Report. The bizarre deadline was the 31st of that month. So people had precisely <laughs> four days in order to to um, submit an application for a new university. The acknowledgement, yeah, the acknowledgement being, that, of course, they knew who was already in the system and so on, but it was this idea of promoting it to a, a wider public activity. Um, it was, to a, to a very large extent, driven again further by further conversations between the UGC secretary at that point, a prominent civil service, called, civil service called Copleston, and the Treasury to help meet the kind of economic concerns about how they would fund this further expansion. 
And so the story continues then in a a variety of different letters which reflect on a growing realisation, I suppose, in the aftermath of the Robbins report that the kinds of arguments that people like Bolchin and others have been making about the lack of any nationally coordinated plan underpinning this was potentially going to create difficulties because universities might be located in the wrong places, probably already were located in the wrong, wrong places, and there was no sense in which this was actually part of the rhetoric that it subsequently being claimed. There's a quote here that indicates that fairly clearly, Um, you know, that the idea that um, there should be greater uh, sense of uh, government control of this. So the new phase of sort of evidence-based planning in higher education, supposedly informed by regional planning, is something of a myth, something that Britain tended to assume was happening in other countries, but was largely uh, not really evidenced by what was going on in these reports. And there's some interesting correspondence about this um, uh, 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 in in this post-Robbins period when they realise they need a map. There's this hilarious moment when they say, ah, we need some cartography. Uh, And so they commission uh, these maps to try and demonstrate how um, there, there is a need to build in these planning for the expansion of universities. At this point, bear in mind just the expansion and conversion of existing universities to take on more students. And that there might have some sense in which it was built in to economic planning. Very interesting that so many of the people involved with this were indeed highly trained, powerful economists. Ledyard, Klaus Moser, all of these people very little sense of them having much geographical understanding about the country in these debates about what was going on in universities. I'll click, up, click over this fairly quickly because what happens eventually is a decision that the process had take, uh, taken its full uh, 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 sequence and under Anthony Crossland, under the Labour government, interestingly, the decision is sent, essentially taken to prov- slow it down dramatically. So, in a way, as a consequence of the Robbins report, which we tend to associate with plate glass universities that were already being planned way before it was actually to to some extent to prevent it. The two universities that were distinctly Robin's new creations rather than existing conversions were Stirling in Scotland, admirable, but the other one is utterly notorious. It's the case of Coleraine in Northern Ireland. And this was not actually part of the Robin's report because of course Northern Ireland is virtually a kind of devolved government in a devolved system in the early 1960s with you know, a kind of highly problematic parliament, as it were, in Northern Ireland go- governing its own affairs, controlled essentially by a Protestant majority. And the Coleraine example is a notorious one because they commissioned a separate report linked to and directly inspired by Robbins, explicitly saying we're using the Robbins methodology, not that there was a methodology in the first place, and we will establish a new university in Northern Ireland, just as Robbins lived in on Greenfield sites. What that meant was they were going to close McGee College in Catholic Derry and open a new university in Coleraine in the heart of Protestant Unionist Northern Ireland. And it is no except no exaggeration to claim that the entire troubles of Northern Ireland start with that process. If you listen, read the reports of John Hume and all those people, like Jerry Fitt, that's what started it, the, the sheer naked injustice of that process. So the idea that this was somehow or other, you know, unrelated to the biggest constitutional crisis of the 20th century in terms of Britain in Northern Ireland, it's the, that university decision was absolutely at the core of it. McGee was eventually saved, but it becomes an offshoot campus of the new campus in in Coleraine, a 19th century institution, by the way, but interestingly, right against the border with the Republic and giving external degrees from Trinity College Dublin rather from the British system. So for political reasons, um, the the legacy of Robbins is actually rather problematic, it seems to me, in all these ways. So let me draw very quickly to a close here, because we've... uh, said enough, I suppose, to get my point across. This final uh, graph, uh, not graph, it's a map, isn't it? I should know that. Um, This final graph simply summarises that that's the complex geography of British universities as it developed uh, in the 19th and uh, 20th century. And this is this rather interesting 
thing, which we're only beginning to explore now, it's the other places that applied either before Robbins or uh, during or afterwards to uh, secure university status. Now, there were some persistent appliers, and they are the dark circles there, which were places that, you know, you could imagine, therefore, had the greatest commitment to having a university, but were never accepted in this 1960s phase. And they are, 10 of them, Bournemouth, Cheltenham, Chester, Gloucester, Hereford, Plymouth, Stamford, uh, Stevenage, Swindon, and Whitby. Now, what would have the university system have looked like? Instead of having universities in Lancaster and Lork and Warwick and all the places that we don't really know where they are, they would have been in some of those places. Now, of course, some of these places now have universities, but that is a result of a much later process. What would have been the this economic significance of this? What would have been the social and cultural significance of this? Of course, it's crucially important because British students tend to move to universities a long way away from their home. The case of Stamford is interestingly, because Stamford has aspired to a university way back to the medieval period. If you are a, a student, a fellow of Brazenose College, Oxford, don't they have some famous uh, toast where they lament the people from the University of Oxford that tried to establish a university in Stamford uh, many centuries ago? So the poor place has been a perfect sort of candidate for university and has failed to do so. So I leave you simply with that counterfactual geography uh, as, an, as an issue to debate, perhaps. Thank you very much indeed.